There are three questions I wanna answer in today's video. The first one is how loud should you be recording? The second one is how do you make your mixes as competitively loud as the professionals out there? And the third question is how loud is too loud? These are questions that come up a lot in the YouTube comment sections for my channel. And I wanna make sure I answer them as much as possible. The best thing you can do to support the channel is hit the like and subscribe button right now. And when the video is over, head over to my website, heychrisgreen.com, join the free newsletter. So every time I've got a video coming out, usually once or twice a week, you'll get an email from me about a new post that's up. Thanks so much for watching. Now let's jump into these three questions. So the first question we wanna answer is how loud you should record. I have some very specific numbers that I think you should shoot for, especially if you're in a home studio environment like I've got here. But it all has to do with analog or digital recording. So back in the day, and even currently, analog equipment was all that there was. And when people would record in studios, what they were going for was as clean a recording as possible. So noise that would come from a tape machine or noise that would come from a console, that was very bad. People didn't like distortion. They wanted everything to be as pure as possible. Well, that certainly changed over time. Bands and musicians and audio engineers, they started pushing components beyond what they were supposed to do. Think about the guitar amp, for example. Nowadays, an amp that doesn't have distortion or doesn't have those tubes that are heating up and giving us some grit, they're known as clean or they're too sterile. Well, back in the day, they were trying to keep things as clean as possible. So the recording level was all about the ratio between distortion and noise and something that was clean and pure. It's not the same today when you're using your Focusrite Scarlett or if you have a PreSonus audio box type audio interface. These things are not meant to distort in the way that analog equipment is meant to distort. So if you have analog equipment, things with tubes or things that distort in a very pleasing way, you might be running your recordings a lot louder, but when it comes to digital audio, when you hit that conversion, when you're going from your analog equipment, you're going into your audio interface, you should be conservative so that you're not clipping in the digital world, okay? Digital clipping, things when you see the red light on PreSonus Studio One, or you see that signal where it tells you that you've clipped in the software, it's usually not the same and it's not as pleasing as when you are distorting something like a guitar amp. So if you're somebody that's using analog equipment and you wanna push that guitar amp to be a little bit louder than it normally is, that's totally fine. But when you go to record in software, whatever signal is going into your computer, you wanna make sure that you're not clipping your converters because things like the Scarlett that I was talking about or the interfaces from PreSonus, some of these more affordable interfaces, they're not meant to be pushed in the same way that guitar amps are meant to be pushed. So here we're gonna get a little bit nerdy. When you're creating a new session in PreSonus Studio One, did you know that below the sample rate where you're choosing between 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz and so forth, there's a drop down arrow next to settings where you can change the resolution. So the resolution is gonna have options on it like 16 bit, 24 bit, 32 bit and so forth. Here's what you need to know. Every single bit in PreSonus Studio One is gonna give you roughly six decibels of dynamic range. Just so you have an idea, here's a chart on screen of what the decibels equate to. So human speech will be a certain amount of decibels, a snare drum or a drum set being played, an airplane taking off is gonna be a certain amount of decibels. So the more bits you have, the more room you have to work with in your dynamics. So obviously 16 bit, if you do the math, 16 bit audio is gonna have a dynamic range roughly of 96 decibels. Okay, that means that anything above 96 decibels is gonna be extremely distorted. It's gonna be clipping. 24 bit, if we do the math, for every bit, you're getting six decibels. 24 bit is gonna give you 144 decibels of dynamic range. 32 bit float is gonna give you 192. And if you're looking at the chart, 192 decibels is just like not even perceivable for our ears. So just like with sample rate, there comes these certain points where the limitations of our human hearing, it's just not worth it to push it to extreme lengths. I'm sure somebody out there is recording at 64 bit float. Personally, if your computer can handle it, keep it at 32 bit float. And what this will mean is that even if you have that red light go off, or even if you see clipping, you can always bring the volume down as long as before you export, if you export something in 24 bit, you need to make sure it's within that 24 bit resolutions dynamic range. 
What does all of that mean? It means if you don't know what I'm talking about, set your bit resolution as high as you can, probably not above 32 bit float, especially if you're getting started out in PreSonus Studio One. This is gonna help you when it comes to recording because if you start seeing a lot of red light or a lot of clipping, if you're in something like 32 bit float, you can turn the volume down after you've already recorded something and it shouldn't be clipping. So here are some specifics of how loud you should record your music. Personally, I'm very conservative when it comes to audio values and I wanna aim for something between negative 12 and negative 24 on the metering. So let me show you in PreSonus Studio One. When you're recording a session in PreSonus Studio One, you can open up the mix tab. And when you open the mix tab, you should see this arrow here. It's like an arrow and then a vertical line going up and down. This has to do with your input monitoring. So if I'm recording something in Studio One, if I snap in front of a microphone, you'll see a blue bar shooting up and down. Now on the metering itself, there are a bunch of really tiny numbers and it's good that you know at least two of these really well. I recommend where you have negative 12 and negative 24. If you can get that blue bar when you're looking at your recording levels, anything between negative 12 and negative 24 is gonna be great. It's gonna give you plenty of detailed information that you can move up the volume later if you need to but also you're far enough away from zero dB that you don't have to worry about clipping. So even when I'm recording drums, something very loud like a snare drum, I'll still try to set the snare drum between negative 12 and negative 24. So audio works kind of backwards. Zero dB is the absolute top limit of peaking, okay? Anything above zero dB is just gonna be flattened out like this, okay? You can't have your dynamics above zero. So everything we do happens below zero. That's why you see negative six, negative 12, negative 24, and so forth. It'll go down to about negative infinity. So anything we're recording, your recording levels between negative 12 and negative 24, you're gonna be good. But if you don't have access to this input monitoring in PreSonus Studio One, there are a couple of plugins I recommend that you check out. The stock plugin is called Level Meter. This is gonna be accessed on any of your tracks. Just click the plus button for inserts. Scroll down in your PreSonus folder, you should see one called Level Meter. Within Level Meter, you're gonna see the same sort of information that you're seeing on the Mix tab. It's just gonna be more detailed and specific. So on screen, I have the Level Meter loaded on this stereo acoustic track I just recorded yesterday. This is a song that we just started. You should be seeing it coming out soon on my YouTube channel. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. I'll break down the mix and everything much later. But for now, it just has a mix tool plugin giving some gain. I've got a VU meter and a level meter plugin. So if I hit play on the acoustic guitar track, let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, on the level meter plugin, you saw a couple of things happening. You saw the blue bar and the blue bar was moving very quick, okay? The blue bar is giving us what's called peak value, okay? So the peak value is very quick and it's gonna measure every instance of dynamics that comes through. So each level that comes through as I'm playing a guitar, you're gonna see the blue meter moving like this. There is a white line that as the blue, mar blue bar is moving, that white line is moving much slower. The white line refers to RMS. RMS is much more similar to what our ears perceive as average volume, okay? So what I tend to do is I want the peak value to of course hover between negative 24, negative 24 and negative 12 as much as possible. But that white horizontal line is what I wanna focus on because that white horizontal line, if I can get it to about negative 18, that's usually gonna be the sweet spot. Now this isn't always gonna be the case, when you're recording things like snare drums that are very transient, they're very quick, like if I'm clapping my hands, I can clap my hands and I'll see the meter shoot up really fast and the average volume, the RMS doesn't have enough time to get up to negative 18, okay? So it's gonna change depending on what you're recording. If you're recording things like the human voice, things that have any sustain to them, like a piano would have a lot of sustain, a guitar chord that's ringing out will have a lot of sustain, a snare drum typically doesn't have a lot of sustain, a hi-hat doesn't have a lot of sustain. Things that are very quick, like hi-hat and snare drum, I wanna be looking at the peak value 
to set my levels as much as possible. And then things that have that sustain, like I was talking about, the voice, the piano, the guitar, I'm looking at that RMS value because RMS is looking at things over a period of time. Peak value is looking at a very quick response, a very quick transient. So think of that that way. The VU meter plugin is also from PreSonus Studio One, and I believe this was a free plugin. So if you have a My PreSonus account, just go to their website, log into your account, and you should be able to see the VU meter. You can download this after you've downloaded PreSonus Studio One because I don't believe it just comes with the base package of Studio One. I think you've got to go on their website and add this on after the fact. On the VU meter, you have the scale, okay? So what this will do, if I set my scale to 18, what it tells me is that zero on the VU meter actually stands for negative 18. And the needle that moves on a VU meter, it moves much more aligned with an RMS rather than a peak value, okay? A VU meter moves much more slowly. So this time when I hit play, both of these meters are metering the acoustic guitar, but I want you to notice the RMS value on the level meter being the white bar going left and right. And I want you to look at the VU meter and see how closely aligned the two of these are because they should be roughly in the same spot. So as you can see, I'm somebody who, I guess because visuals of it, I really like VU meters. In fact, back in the day when I bought the Warm Audio WA-2A, a lot of it was because if you put a VU meter on something, like I'm just a sucker for VU meters. I like seeing VU meters. It lets me know that what I'm doing, I'm not tricking myself in my ears. But the main thing I want you to understand is that without using metering, your ears can deceive you. If you turn up the volume on your headphones, if you turn it up loud enough, you can convince yourself that something is really loud and sounding good. But if you look on the metering, if you're not even hitting like negative 24 at all, your audio signal could be very quiet. So make sure you're using some sort of metering. VU meter, level meter are great plugins to use. And then of course on the mix tool, if the mix tab, if you bring the mix tab up, you can see more information. So now I'm gonna remove this VU meter. Let's get that out of the way. We're gonna take a listen again to this acoustic guitar track. And I want you to look at the fader for the acoustic guitar. You should be able to see the metering as well. If you right click anywhere on the fader, you can have it show just the peak value if you want without any RMS. If I right click again, what I have mine set to is peak and RMS. So I want to see that white line hovering as much as possible. But you can also change the RMS length. So if you want it to take a lot longer to hold in that position, you can change it to one second if you want to. I'm perfectly fine with 0.6 seconds. You can also have a peak hold. So if you're worried about how loud that peak is actually hitting, let's set it to peak hold and see what happens. Okay, so peak hold has got these little blue bars. So again, this is a stereo acoustic guitar track. The blue bars that are horizontal at the top, they're holding in place, letting me know where I'm at. That's pretty nifty to have. So now we need to discuss how to make our mixes competitively as loud as professional mixes out there. And it all comes down to limiting, okay? So if you're somebody that really avoids compression, limiting, and distortion, you may find that a lot of your mixes, they are gonna sound more natural, they're gonna sound more dynamic, but they're also not gonna sound as competitive as stuff that you would hear on the radio or on Spotify, okay? If you're listening to stuff that's in pop music or country music or rock music, you're definitely gonna have to make use of what's called a limiter. So if I go to my main output bus and I insert a limiter plugin, the limiter plugin from PreSonus Studio One is basically a brick wall compressor that's not gonna allow audio to go above a certain point. The benefit of this is we can really squeeze out as much of the track as possible, giving us more volume. 
So on the limiter plugin, I like to set the ceiling to about negative one at least. It just makes me feel better that I'm not going anywhere near that clipping. And then essentially you just want to take the gain knob and keep turning up the track so that it gets louder and louder, keeping an eye on the reduction because the amount of reduction is how much limiting is happening to the signal. So most people out there, when they're loading a limiter plugin, they're gonna turn up that gain volume until you start to see a little bit of reduction, maybe like one or two decibels, but not much, okay? That's gonna get you as competitive as you can be without squashing your mix. So a lot of times, like I mentioned, Taylor Swift, Adele, Ed Sheeran, a lot of these pop artists and people that are in these massive studios, they are squeezing every single dynamic that they can out of a track by using mastering plugins. And they can do this with a very, I don't wanna say transparent way, but they can do it with more transparency than what most of us are capable of doing in a home studio environment. So if you're just using the PreSonus limiter plugin, aim for about negative one to negative two decibels of gain reduction. I'm gonna push it to its limit so that you can hear what that gain reduction sounds like if it's too much. When you start limiting stuff too much, it just sounds really bad. So let's take a listen to that. I'm gonna gra gradually bring up the gain volume so you can hear how loud we can get this acoustic guitar track. massively distorted. So we're getting a lot of compression, a lot of limiting happening on it. But back when it was only giving us about two or three decibels of gain reduction, it's perfectly acceptable. The last thing I want you to know when it's talking about how loud is too loud. So let's answer that question. In modern day recording, we have so many apps like Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, they are all actually using programs to change the volume of your tracks. Now, it used to be a lot more controversial because you would go on YouTube or you'd be on Spotify or iTunes and you would listen to one person's song and when you went to the next song, there would either be this massive drop off in volume or from song to song, some would be really loud, some would be really quiet. And this was bad business for the streaming platforms. People were complaining about how they would be listening to something and all of a sudden their ears are exploding because track to track, artist to artist, the volumes aren't the same. So a lot of these companies, they started implementing sound check or things that would automatically bring down the volume of loud tracks. So this actually exposed a lot of tracks for the amount of limiting that they do, okay? You basically can't get louder than zero, okay? So any amount of limiting you do is gonna help your mix because to my knowledge, these platforms will absolutely turn down your track if it's too loud but they won't bring up a track's volume that's too quiet. So if you're listening to something from an orchestra or something that's meant to be really transparent, really dynamic, it's probably gonna be very quiet compared to something like from Ed Sheeran or John Mayer. What this means though, is that you don't need to squash your mix. Like there should be no competition in how many decibels you can squash out of your mix. If you're getting two to three decibels on average of limiting on the end of your mix, it should hold up pretty well. If you're trying to push your limiter to extreme limits just so you can match somebody that's professionally recorded, don't be surprised that your track might actually sound quieter than someone else's track that's also been limited, okay? So for all intents and purposes, when you're limiting your tracks, don't think of it as, okay, I need to get 20 decibels of volume out of this track just push the limiter so that you're getting like one or two decibels of limiting for the most part, your dynamic sections of the song and your streaming platforms will take care of the rest. They will make your volume as competitive as it can be when compared to somebody like Adele or John Mayer and so forth. But just know that if you're somebody out there that's a purist and you really don't like using effects plugins, you don't like using compression and distortion, your songs will probably sound a lot quieter than other people's. So don't think of limiting as being as bad of a thing as it can be. So back in the day, people were abusing the limiter. If you're getting one to two decibels of limiting consistently throughout your song, it should be competitively matched in volume to something else that's on the radio, quote unquote. So the streaming platforms are gonna certainly level match 
your song to someone else's. But if your song is too quiet, you might come across as too quiet. They will not bring up the volume of your track. They will only bring down the volume of loud tracks, if that makes sense. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video. I know it's kind of a rant going into some nerdy territory, but I hope this has been beneficial to you, especially if you're out there confused about how loud you should record or how to make your recordings a lot louder. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons and I'll see you in the next video.